Hello, and welcome to the Northwood Podcast. I'm your host, Heath Jones. This episode, I should warn you up front, is going to be a longer one. Maybe that's good news to you. I've had a few people tell me they think they should be longer. Uh, but yeah, this one's going to be longer than usual, so I'm going to try to keep this housekeeping portion as brief as I can. You should know up front the, the, that the Northwood Podcast is a ministry of Northwood Christian Church, the church that I pastor, part of the Disciples of Christ denomination. We are an open and affirming local church, accepts all people, and um, welcome them with the love of God, with, with no desire to change them except, <laughs> except to grow in love. That's my church. You should come and check it out. Uh, but this podcast is produced and distributed by the All Indiana Podcast Network. And the All Indiana Podcast Network produces and distributes podcasts made by Indiana folk, Hoosiers as we call ourselves, and often about topics relevant to our state and our local affairs. Uh, so for more, if you're interested, uh, please visit www.wishtv.com backslash podcasts. That's wishtv.com backslash podcast, and there you'll be able to find the full offerings of the All Indiana Podcast Network. Also, I would encourage you to subscribe, like, or follow our podcast on whatever app that you use to podcast from to listen. Uh, that way you'll be notified when there are new episodes. And um, and yeah, it'll also help get our podcast into more, more listening ears, I am told, the more interactions we have like that. So please, please um, interact or write in would be great too. If you'd like to know more about our church, uh, you can visit our website, which is www.indync.org. That's ndncc.org. There you'll be able to find service times uh, when we have church on Sundays, 1045, by the way, food pantry hours, and our full calendar, as well as recordings of previous lessons and services, if you like something that you hear here. So if, you, if you're interested, again, that's www.indync.org. And moving on, and I know I said that I'd be quick. I don't think that I'm being very quick, but um, moving on, nonetheless. We are entering into our season of fundraising at our church, which means that you're going to be hearing talk about money in the next coming weeks. And talks about money, especially in church, uh, turn off a lot of people. And if this turns you off, um, I give it a chance. Because at my church, hopefully you'll be happy or surprised or pleased to discover that we try to only value money so far as it enables us to make a positive change in our world. And so I think this will come through as we proceed. So so bear with us. But first, before we get to even that, we need to pause for uh, some ads. If you're listening, um, we will catch you after these ads. And here we go. Credit Karma makes building your credit straightforward and stress-free with help from our credit builder. Sign up today at creditkarma.com and start enhancing your financial health. Credit Karma, your partner in building a brighter financial future. Credit Builder Plan is serviced by Credit Karma Credit Builder and requires a line of credit and savings account provided by Cross River Bank member FDIC. It's better over here. Now at T-Mobile, get four 5G phones on us and four lines for $25 a line per month when you switch with eligible trade-ins. All on America's largest 5G network. Minimum of four lines for $25 per line per month with auto pay discount using debit or bank account. $5 more per line without auto pay, plus taxes and fees and $10 device connection charge. Phones via 24 monthly bill credits for well-qualified customers. Contact us before canceling entire account to continue bill credits or credit stop and balance on required finance agreement due. Bill credits end if you pay off devices early. Ctmobile.com. And we're back. As I was talking about earlier, before the ad break, we are going to be talking about money, and our leaping off point is going to be a Bible passage found in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. That's 10, 17 through 31, and I'll just read it for you now. It goes, reading from the New Revised Standard Version, updated edition. As he, he being Jesus, was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, One thing you lack, go Sell what you own 
and give the money to the poor, and you will receive treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard is it, or how hard it will be, for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God? And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, Children, how hard is it to enter the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God... Sorry, let me repeat that. Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God, all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly, I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, fields with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And that is the end of that rather lengthy uh, reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verses 17 through 31. And I must admit, I was excited when I first saw this text for today, because this week marks our church's first week in our yearly stewardship drive, as I said before the ad break and before I read the scripture. Every year in October, we begin to talk about money with the mind to discern together as a, as a community. One, how much we as individuals can give to our church and its ministries. And two, what would we like to invest our resources in together as the collective in the coming year? So when I saw today's text in the lectionary, the, the selected readings for, for churches generally, I knew my job was already half done. I mean, what more perfect story could there be for a pastor to preach and make the point that God's people should not be greedy than this one? And there's that bit in the middle about the camel going through the needle's eye. Impossible. And the disciples even thought so. Which is why we try and make sense of it. Perhaps you've heard it said, that there was a certain gate somewhere in the walls of Jerusalem that Jesus was referring to by this eye of needle talk, whereby a camel had to crawl unladen with its burden so that it could enter into the city. And if I were to make sense of the story in this way, and I've heard it preached this way, good sermons, I'd say something like, you know, it is impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a sewing needle, which is why this is not at all what is suggested here. I haven't preached that sermon. And then I'd go on to talk about this gate this alleged gate. I then go on to describe the process by which someone might, whilst unburdening their camel for the tight fit, uh, go through this process where the camel's proprietor would assess each and every one of the possessions. This is a moment where they can take a, take a pause and, and hold in their hands and pass along and weigh, feel the weight of what they have and perhaps leave behind what they don't really need. And let me tell you, that'll preach. Um, and I have done it to great effect before. And um, good sermon. Um, I think that what comforts us about this interpretive approach, about the eye of a needle not being interpreted literally as the eye of a literal sewing needle, is that it leaves uh, what we keep on the other side of this rather open-ended. I mean, it could be, using this example, going with it, you pack just the right amount, but maybe your camel reflects the balance of a life lived in harmony with their possessions. A minimalist, perhaps. You came into it as a minimalist. So this, has, this story has nothing on you, right? Wouldn't that be nice? But seriously, do we trust ourselves to be the best judge of these things? I mean, isn't it rather our tendency to seldom know the hold that our possessions have on us until someone calls us out? If I were trying to fit my metaphorical camel through the hypothetical smallish gate, I'd try to squeeze in as much as I could keep as much as I could. I'd want to take as much with me as I could possibly justify, which is why I was disappointed, especially when I had 
half the sermon already written in my head before I sat down to study it. I was disappointed when the commentaries I read on the text each went out of their way to correct this myth about that camel's gait. Turns out it isn't true, and there, there wasn't one. Dr. Ron Allen writes in his commentary, uh, his commentary called Preaching the Gospel Without Blaming the Jews, co-written written with uh, Clark Williamson. May he rest in peace. Anyway, they, they write, quote, Mark twice says that the wealthy find it difficult to enter into the realm of God. Some Christians soften verse 25 by postulating a tiny gate, the eye of the needle, through which a camel could painfully enter. But no such gate existed. It means what it says. Dot, dot, dot. And here, I thought I'd end the quote or leave it hanging for dramatic effect to really hammer in the point that we are meant to think of a literal camel and a literal needle's eye here. And, and I'll finish that quote later, and you'll see why. But it also explains what comes next. This, the absurdity of Jesus' illustration, is why the disciples respond the way that they do. If they knew about that other gate, you know, they, they would say, okay, good, sound advice. We get our minds around that, but they understand what Jesus is saying, that it's basically that it is as difficult for a, 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 a huge camel, taller than we are, just you know, back taller than me for sure, to pass through a pinhole than for the rich to make it through themselves. And that's harsh. And I know that I say this to an audience that has not a few in it, that most in the history of our world, of, of most in human history, would consider rich. I include myself in that. And it does sound, sound harsh. And you've got to consider the context. Remember, the Jesus movement that we are a part of was just getting underway in this story. And those who followed Jesus felt as if they were on the cusp of a transition between the old age, the old ways of sin that they had always known, and the new ways, the new realm of God, or the kingdom of God as it's translated often, I'll, I'll say realm of God. And the convergence of these forces that opposed God's coming realm, the Caesar in, in Rome, the Roman army generally, those that partnered with the Romans to um, um, keep the people under sway, oligarchs, etc. Those against the forces of God's realm, which here is Jesus, John the Baptist, the disciples, the prophets generally going way back, the covenant-keeping Hebrews, and of which Jesus considered him apart, himself apart, by the way. And now Gentiles, that's you and me, newly invited in. And in such a context, it was thought, and this is important to hold in front of our mind to remember to understand what's going on here. In that time, it was thought there's no time to waste. That's why all these parables about the, the last hour and, and why we must always be ready. Because why invest one single nickel or spark of life towards a world that was thought to be ending. So the early church made sure that in their community, everyone gave out of the abundance of what God had given them. And you can read the early chapters of the book of Acts that record or purport to write down the stories of the early times of the church. At least this is how it's supposed to go, right? The record, records actually show that we Christians have seldom, if ever, really behaved in this way, at least not for very long and in, in, in large numbers. But we were always meant to. It's the aspiration anyway. And this comes through in this passage. The rich man brings up what he had thought was all that his faith had asked of him. He kept the basic commandments. No murder, no stealing. Probably never took the Lord's name in vain. That's not exactly listed here. Um, and where is his wealth? Where, what do his... Con his possessions have to do with this conversation. Where do they come in? Well, both Jesus and the Apostle Paul write of the law that was given to the Hebrew people as rules necessary for living in the old age, the broken age. And these are the rules that the man is naming back to Jesus. Rules that we still live by. If all of God's children were full of love, though, for one another, as we will be in the new age that we hope for, we wait for, one would need no commands not to murder or steal. It'd be intuitive. The hatred would die in us. We, we would need no commands over and against these things or other things, the greeds, the jealousies, all of these things. These rules are for those of us who need moral guidance. And we all need it, don't we? And so 
the man enlisting these all back to Jesus is naming the rules that he has kept in the old age. And Jesus is saying, for you to understand the new realm, the realm that Jesus has brought with him, you have to realize that there, these laws are boiled down to two commands, both having to do with love, love for God and love for others. And in an age of scarcity, like the time Jesus was living, this should have compelled people like our rich man in this story to then offload what they have to ensure that all within the beloved community around them had all that they needed, especially if you thought that the world wouldn't be there for very long. Why keep it anyway? Jesus is, Jesus is here pushing against humanity's tendency not to do this. And Jesus knows that it's in large part that it's because we do not see correctly. So Jesus tries to help us see and to understand as evil or as sin, to use another churchy or theological word, this problem of greed and, and clinging to our material goods as if it were the point of living. This was the problem in the parable of the rich farmer who had that bumper crop. Jesus told this story in the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. And in that story, if you recall, if not, I'll recount it for you. A man has fields that produce more than he needed or expected, so he resolved within himself to build bigger barns, tear down his old ones even, to store and to save it all. This could be today's equivalent of opening maybe a larger savings account just because you have it. He was then called a fool by God, no less. You can read it for yourself in the 12th chapter of Luke, as I said. He then learns he's about to die and so would in the end be left sitting on a pile of worthless, rotting food that he could never enjoy, or anyone else for that matter. In the end, the man's choice comes off as heartless and cold when you think about it deeply. For if his community were like most everyone else's, then there were surely hungry people nearby or just outside his gates whose situation could have been alleviated out of the abundance of what God had caused to grow on his property. What God had caused to grow on his property, lest he forget. And there are those, like this man, who think that those who win in life are those who end life with ample resources left over. Jesus reminds us, though, again and again, that we cannot keep it. There is no such thing, really, as left over. And in today's teachings, he says that to remain in such a mindset will keep us outside of God's realm, of enjoying the joys of a life lived well as Jesus intends. So he tells the rich man here in our story what he needs to do. And the text says that Jesus does so out of love, explicitly. Hear it again. Verse 21 of Mark 10, Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Verse 22, when he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. But Jesus loved him. So we must assume that what Jesus told him, he did so out of love. He does not want this man to be sad. However, the man left not only shocked, but grieving. He cannot believe what Jesus is telling him. As it flies in the face of conventional wisdom, the wisdom you and I were raised in, and perhaps in the face of his own conception of the meaning of life. So he leaves sad. He has been taught to think wrongly about these things. But here's what you need to know. Jesus doesn't want any of us to leave here sad. He, he doesn't want us to leave this conversation sad. He doesn't want us to leave this life feeling sad. Jesus came so that we might have true joy and contentment. It used to be said to me in my youth that God didn't want us to be happy, but to be holy. And I took that then to mean that God wanted me to keep all those boring rules that, or sometimes important rules that we were just discussing earlier, even if they made me unhappy or caused me to give up honest joys and pursuits because it was thought that inner piety mattered most of all. You know, being sanctimonious, I guess. Holier than thou. But this is not what Jesus taught us. He taught us that we could be happy and holy. I say all of this to remind us that although the rich man left this conversation sad, he didn't have to. Jesus didn't want him to leave sad, but rather wiser and also full of joy. And the same could be said of us right here, right now. But it's hard without the Spirit of God's help 
Jesus understands this, which is why he went on to lament the difficulty that we will have. The way ahead will be difficult for the likes of those like the rich man, you and me too. And here's where all of that camel through the eye of a needle stuff comes to play. The disciples rightly react in surprising discomfort at the idea presented, or even posing the question, they talk amongst themselves, who then can be saved? Because they, unlike many of us today, get it. Literal camel, camel, literal eye of a needle, literally impossible. And I I like this, because I hope you notice it. Because if you are considered rich by your society standards, Here's where you can catch a breath and, and breathe a bit easier. If I, mean, I can too. Uh, because who can be saved? These poor disciples are asking. It's like no one can. If, if it's a camel, I have a needle. So, so maybe if you felt a bit, you know, hard pressed by this, by the hard teachings of this lesson, you should feel a little less alone or singled out at this point. So who can be saved then? Who can be saved from this mindset of greed that causes... So much hurt, violence, and pain in the world. Who then? As I've said, I put myself in the mix. I have my own struggles and demons, prejudices and angers that I hold too close. And I have my own possessions. And I'm often in conversation with those, and sometimes I'm unsure. Am I a good steward of what God has given me? If I fully understood what God would have me do with my money and resources, would I, too, leave the conversation shocked and sad? Sometimes, I admit, I think that I do leave these conversations sad. So where's the hope? Well, to conclude that quote earlier that I read from Dr. Allen, uh, from his commentary, I'll read it again with the finish to that sentence that I, I left hanging. Mark twice says that the wealthy find it difficult to enter the realm of God. Some Christians soften it, verse 25, by postulating a tiny gate, eye of a needle, through which a camel could painfully enter, No such gate existed. It says what it means, and here's where I'll conclude the quote. Although God graciously makes it possible for even the wealthy to be welcomed into the divine realm. And here, Dr. Allen cites verse 27, which reads, Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible. Can't buy your way into heaven. But not for God. For God, all things are possible. Turns out, there's no one left out of reach. In fact, as Jesus says this, Peter begins to understand that he and his friends have already begun the process by the grace of Jesus, at the call of Jesus. And it has has been hard if you have read the story up to this point. So Jesus began to say to him, verse 28, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Here, Peter cuts a contrast between the life of the disciples and the life of the rich man who had not joined the movement. We're meant to hold those two and see the difference. The the man leaving sad, the rich man leaving sad, not joining. And Peter perhaps wanting to know, and and Jesus is about to supply this answer in any case, is that whether or not those like him who give up everything for the pursuit of the realm of God will also end up sad at the end, grieving like the man who had just left. To which Jesus answers, verse 29, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields for my sake, or for the sake of the good news, who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age. Houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, fields, with persecutions. In other words, it will be hard. My insert there, parathetical insert. Back to the text, Jesus goes on, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. That last line, chapter 10, verse 31. So here Jesus describes life in the body of Christ as it is meant to be. That is, life in the churches or communities that gather in the name of Jesus. Uh, You may think that when you enter in, you are giving up your precious goods and resources to be lost forever, or that your journey along with Jesus will be a lonely one. Not so. As you've discovered at our church at Northwood, my church, as we've shared our resources with one another, as we've begun to more and more, and with strangers, we've discovered ourselves to have more than we ever knew before we let go of them, these things. To let go of our old ways, it seems, in the ways of our world full of greed and violence, 
Well, it will require an anxious moment of letting go what has been familiar, what we've been told to trust, what we've told will buy our salvation, the American dream in so many forms. And this will be disorienting as our values conform to the ways and mind of God. But as it all shakes out, we will discover that Jesus has not called us to leave here sad. Rather, we are called to enter into the joy of God. Those in our present age who fight for and clamor for the money, the possessions, or what Jesus referred to as what moth and rust destroy and what thieves break in and steal in the Gospel of Matthew, those who cannot let these go will leave this life sad. Or as Jesus puts it here, the first will be last. But the last, they will be first. Those who take the plunge, those who are able to convert and turn from the philosophies of our age to follow the gospel of Jesus will find themselves in turn lifted up. Child of God, loved and cared for right alongside everyone else in the community. There will be no lasts or firsts, but only a restored order and God's children reconciled to one another and fully loved. So each year, around this time, we are invited for the umpteenth time to take the plunge, as it were. That is, we are called to put ourselves in the place of this rich man with the question on our minds, what are we called to let go of for the life of our community and for the life of our world? People in Jesus' age thought that the new age was imminent, the good times, the perfect times, coming. So they were challenged to sell everything. I mean, if the world as you knew it was about to end, why would you keep any of it? But in the decades after Jesus's earthly ministry, the early church began to reconcile themselves to the reality that they might have to learn how to live in the world for the foreseeable future, that the coming of God's realm in full was not as imminent as they had thought, unfortunately. Although its blessings were just there for people to find, but more to come, unfortunately. So we wait, and in time, Christians began to plan for a future in our broken old age once again. And I mean, they started to do this from the very beginning. Even in the Gospels and letters, it, it's reflected the anxiety in, that the early Christian communities felt as their Lord's return was delayed decade by decade. People began to die. What of them? And at first, you know, people began to sell houses and fields in anticipation and then they kept the houses and fields for they knew they need them for the foreseeable future. But in time, well, the temptation in any age is to fall back into old patterns. And boy, don't we. This is where we find ourselves still. We are still sharing the heart of the man in our story, often perplexed and saddened by what Jesus may ask of us. But Jesus did not call us to leave these conversations sad. I'll remind you again, if we could instead be changed by these words and this wisdom, We'd find the joy that comes from taking Jesus' words seriously and then conforming our life to these patterns. Here I'm trying to find my own words, but I think I should turn again to my mentor and teacher, Dr. Ron Allen, because I don't think I could say it any better. So I'll quote again from his commentary, Preaching the Gospel Without Blaming the Jews, that he co-wrote with Clark Williamson. In verse 158, Few Christians today think the world is about to end. If we give away everything, we are likely to become a burden to the world we seek to serve. Nonetheless, we should use our resources to witness to God's love for all and God's will for justice for all. The preacher can encourage the wealthy to see that clinging to wealth can prevent them from experiencing the fullness of life. Living with less in the Jewish mode of living for the sake of others can mean living more. And that is the point. We leave not sad, but with more when we understand the role of our possessions, the, the role they are meant to play in our lives. So let's not leave sad, this conversation. Let's instead leave with open hearts and open hands. That is, let's allow this moment to challenge us and our relationship to our stuff, broadly speaking. If we were asked to give it all, how sad would we be? And if we were prompted by God's Holy Spirit to give but some, how sad then? As I said, this message marks the beginning of Northwood's season of stewardship. And this is a perfect note to start on, for not only has God offered in moments like these a chance to have our change of heart and perspective, but we are also reminded that this is our road to joy. Every year we get reminded of where we should walk on the road to joy. 
And Jesus said in this passage that we would receive, if we enter into it with the right mind in relation to our possessions, we would receive a hundredfold in this age if we live into this way. That is the way that calls us to hold on to what God has given us with open hands. That is, we do not need to wait until whatever comes next to experience the joy we were meant for. If we can trust in God now and share generously with all as God has called us, then we will not leave these conversations sad, but happier and wiser every time. And this is at least what I've been told. The most generous people I know, I do believe, are the happiest. This is merely an anecdotal observation on my part, but I looked it up and it turns out that stinginess, studies have shown, leads to misery, not only for those in need, the heart of the, the miser, the greedy person, but for the human soul as well. Ebenezer Scrooge from the story, Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens, a typecast for a person or a kind of person that we all know. Maybe even that person lives in part in us. Contrarywise, generosity leads to higher levels of happiness and contentment even among those we think of as poor. In fact, the poor tend to be more generous, studies have shown. If more of us were as generous as, the, as many of the poor, there would be fewer poor. We'd consume differently as a culture. We wouldn't be chewing up the planet and scrapping it for parts. If more of us had our hearts changed by Jesus, I do not think that the reckless pursuit of profits would drive our economy or our politics or our religious lives. What's more, and I'll say it for the last time, Jesus does not want us to leave these conversations or moments sad. That means you and me doesn't want us to be sad at the end of this talk. The man in our story could have left what he had to follow Jesus, as had the disciples. And his disciples would discover along the way that Jesus walked the joyful path, albeit challenging, and ours is the same journey. So what has God called you, me, to leave behind in this season? And don't worry, Jesus is no liar. You may well be sad at the contemplation of parting with some of what God has given you to steward and share, but once you've let go, Jesus has promised we'd find the joyous life we were made for. So take some moments in the coming hours, days, or weeks, maybe the rest of your life, to decide. Then, when you see it, when God speaks, leave what you must behind. And take heart and walk in joy, for your whole life is now ahead of you. This has been the Northwood Podcast. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe to the podcast by way of whatever app you use to listen or leave a comment. These points of engagement drive more traffic our way. Or check out our website, www.indync.org. And also check out the other podcasts produced by the All Indiana Podcast Network. Until next time, this has been the Northwood Podcast. I am Heath Jones. Peace.